Hello and welcome to the Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar, helping you cultivate a life you love. Your mindset is like a muscle that needs to be strengthened and conditioned. And this is your mindset workout. You know, one of the topics that I think is so important and absolutely relevant right now and needed right now is, you know, how do we help and support our teens during a pandemic? Now, you know, being an, an adolescent is tough at the best of times, but going through adolescence during a pandemic is a completely different thing. And I was actually inspired to do this show through a conversation that I had I recently had with one of my nieces. She's a, the youngest is a teenager. And, you know, just listening to her, I thought, you know what, we really need to start paying attention and really checking in and seeing if you really are okay. You know, so are our are, are teenagers okay? And those teenagers could be certainly anyone around you, right? Because sometimes we just assume that everyone is okay. But there's a heavy weight that has been placed on the kids today. You know, kids, teenagers love, of course, to hang out with their friends. They are now stuck at home, not being able to hang out with their friends. You know, boyfriends, girlfriends are always top priority. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was a teenager and my life revolved around my friends and around my boyfriend. So right now, having that sort of taken away or feeling restricted has created a lot of chaos. So I've brought in the expert to really help us out. Jason Thomas, my special guest today. He is the host of Parents Canada Talk Radio right here on Saga 960 AM. But he's also an expert in, you know, how to help us develop stronger communication styles and be able to have those, those really powerful conversations. And right now, we really need to have those powerful conversations conversations with the teenagers so important so Jason I thank you so much and I welcome having you here on the mindset mentor today Tony thanks so much you, you know I, I listened to your intro and I think I'm thinking to myself can you, anyone ever actually claim to be an expert as a parent <laughs> we're always two <laughs> steps behind and then you throw a pandemic into the mix mm. oh my goodness yeah, you know, I totally get it. And that's the thing is that I think, you know, everybody's struggling, right? Parents are thinking, you know, what do I do? How do I motivate? How do I encourage? How do I parent? Um, and where's the boundary? So, so how can we differentiate, you know, what is just kind of that regular teenage attitude behavior versus now the depressive behavior, the lack of motivation, you know, the, 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 the pain that's going on now in the pandemic, how do we really try to, to look at that and say, all right, you know, here's the dividing line. There is no line. The truth is that teens have struggled with mental health. It's just that our understanding of what that looks like and how we parent has changed. The number of times when we, when we launched Parents Canada Talk Radio that I got uh, we got on the air with somebody who was promoting the show and, and said, you know, when I was a kid, my mom parented us like X, right? And it's like, really? So you were a kid in 1981. Has anything anywhere changed since 1981? Well, of course they have. And our understanding of, of particularly around mental health and, and teenagers, it's not simply a, a concept of attitude. It, there's a lot going on underneath the hood. If you struggle with anything as an adult, the foundation for that comes from your childhood and, and your teenage years. Any, uh, any you know, uh, mindset approach that you deal with, like, like a, you know, if, if you deal with a professional psychotherapist, a therapist will tell you all that stuff starts right there. And you know, we just went through, what was it? Bell Let's Talk Day and all that sort of stuff. So mental health and awareness is, is heightened. You know, anxiety, for example, is one of the things that teens are, have struggled with before the pandemic fairly significantly. Something like one in five teens will go through um, some sort of some sort of mental health thing that that actually requires some level of intervention and I'll, I'll tell you the dial is getting cranked all the way to the top for, for teenagers right now in terms of how they're dealing with it I, I anecdotally I see and I hear from almost every single parent I've got three bio kids and I extended kids uh, as many as three more 
you know, of, of that group, there, there are some real struggles that are happening right now. And so the first thing that you have to know is that idea of there is no line. If you, if you apply the right level of empathy and open your ears wide enough, you're going to realize that you have a role to play as a parent in how you help them build the, uh, the resilience and the skills that they need as they move towards adulthood so that they can address any kind of shortcomings, any issues that they might have. Yeah, you know, absolutely well said. You know, the thing is, is that, see, so many people have said, you know, for, for forever, it's that common thing where it's like, oh, well, kids are so resilient. They, they're resilient. They bounce back. But, you know, we have to really pay attention to that because they may not be as resilient as we think they are. So I think that that's the importance is that we really need to check in. Um, are there some questions that we can sort of, you know, navigate around to really help to bring up the conversation to, to you know, make it, uh, you know, to have the empathy and the compassion that is so important, but right. to also have the teen receive it. So how do we, you know, even just begin to broach that subject? The first thing that you do is you don't wait until there's a subject you have to broach. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to build a strong infrastructure of communication with your kids that begins when they're little, little, little and ends when they end. Because the truth is, is that if you, if you just kind of show up when they're in crisis, you've missed the boat. You know, the ability to have a strong relationship with them. And, and I'll give you a, a personal example. So I have a daughter who's 15 mm -hmm. and last June, early in the pandemic, you know, um, I have a, I always like to say a very complex situation with my kids, right? Because I have many, I have, I have three kids from three relationships. And because of that, there are extended families everywhere. And, and in one extended family, there's one kid who's immunocompromised. So as we were learning around the, uh, around COVID and what, what we could expect, there was real concern for him. And one of those concerns meant that my 15 year old daughter was spending a lo little bit more time at, at her mom's house. She wasn't having a good space there and she was struggling. And, and I remember, Remember, she was having a difficult time talking with her mom about all of this, but she didn't have a difficult time coming to me. And the reason was, and I, this is no, no shot at, at mom. We all parent yeah. differently and we learn, Absolutely. but, but it's her, her, uh, her modeling approach to, to parenting. And we talk a lot on the show about modeling as your number one tool is her modeling. Like her parents were American middle of Kansas. So, you know, total red state and, and it's what I say, what I do and that sort of thing. And my approach is, a, is a little bit different, you know, kind of, I grew up with, you know, pseudo hippies as, as parents and, and because of those modeling, our approach to things was different. And, and again, I'm a communications professional. And so it's a big part of who I am as is emotional intelligence. It was no problem for her to come to me and say, look, here's where I am. And, and because of that, I was able to communicate with her mom. And I remember, I remember in the middle of COVID, we're sitting outside in the parking lot of a school last June in lawn chairs, 15 feet apart from each other <laughs> and able to have a conversation around her mental health and, and what we needed to do it. And what we did actually choose at the time was to get intervention. So to have a, a therapist who could be empathetic and help her uh, articulate her own thoughts. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm a, I'm a comms professional, but at the same time, if your dad is constantly in your face and saying, you know, you should learn empathy and you should learn great question. You're going to tune out. So yeah, it's good to have that third party, for, third party there. And then allows me then to, to connect with her effectively. So that I think that's a, a big thing, right? Is that idea of understanding mm -hmm. if you're going to communicate with your kids, don't start on the day you notice the trouble. You have to start long, long before that and make really a culture in your household where they feel that they can come to you and say that what's the thing, you know, like when kids are 18, 19 and, and dad says, you know, if you go out and, and drink tonight, rather than drive home, give me a call. Well, you know what, if you have a history of yelling at them when they do something wrong, then they're not going to call you. So you have to establish that early. Oh my God, that's so true. You know, and I think we can all relate to that. And, you know, obviously as parents, you, you're, you're never going to have all of the answers and you don't have to do it alone. So I love that, you know, you being in communications, being able to have those conversations, you recognize that, you know what, in this situation, we're going to seek that external help. And I think that um, that's so important for us now to also realize that you just don't have to do it all alone because parents are also going through their own mental health issues. You know, the, the world has changed so dramatically. Yeah. We're all adjusting, struggling. You know, people have not only the day-to-day -day changes with, you know, being at home, either isolated alone 
or isolated with family members where they may have had, you know, work and school to have their own private time. And now everybody's, you know, maybe piled on top of each other, essentially, right, um, which can create a lot of stress. So yeah. people are really trying to figure out how to navigate the whole system. So you don't need to do it all by yourself. So I love having conversations like this with you, Jason, that you can help guide us, you know, give us some ideas, just a little bit of advice. I think, you know, for me, um, it has always been so important that, that, you know, I've learned from other people. And that's why, like, I love books. I love, I you know, love personal development. I've always loved that because I learned so much from other people, right? And I think what are, that- What are you reading right now? What are you reading right now? Oh, I'm reading a, a phenomenal book called Letting Go by David Hawkins. Brilliant. And in yep. fact, you know, you had mentioned something earlier about how, um, you know, it really is not about just these conversations that we're having now as adults. It starts, you know, that, that, that foundation of who we are and how we handle things started as children, right? And so as teens, you know, we, we develop certain patterns and that certainly we take that into, you know, adulthood. So really, you know, the book is very much about that and, you know, letting go, releasing, you know, some of that, that pent up trauma. And, and I'm all about uh, clearing limiting beliefs. It's something that I address and talk about, you know, in my book. And it, it, it really is that, you know, everything, um, our, our personalities shaped and molded by our environments, our circumstances, and how we handle things. So how we do one thing is how we do everything. And so we need to start recognizing some of those patterns right. and really start to clear the negative thought processes, the negative patterns that are not serving us so that we now can actually have a powerful conversation and not be inundated with all the negative mind chatter and the limiting beliefs that, that hold us back. Um, so it's really important, I think, for everybody at this time as we're in this, this moment of, of um, you know, isolation, I think it's important to really, you know, get still and listen to the silence sometimes, right? And take that moment of pause, regroup and try to think of, you know, things that can be helpful instead of focusing on all the, the negatives because they both exist simultaneously, right? So the good and the bad, and they're always there. So what are we going to choose? Now, we can't always choose to, um, you know, be positive every minute of the day. That's unrealistic and that's not going to happen, right? But we can certainly, for the majority, try to focus and make those better choices. I do believe that, you know, it's important to, uh, you know, really focus the mindset in those moments. You know, for example, um, Jason, I was talking to, to my niece just the other day, and she was saying to me, she goes, you're going to be so proud of me. Um, she says, I'm, you know, she's been following someone on Instagram, and she, she uh, has signed up to get daily affirmations. And I was right. like, awesome. I love that. Positivity, positive affirmations. Because right now, uh, a lot of teenagers, a lot of adults even, are you know, running that narrative in, in the mind of this is terrible. This is awful. I feel deprived. I feel uh, stress, overwhelm, all these things that we constantly say to ourselves. Well, those become negative affirmations. I think it's, you know, really important to override some of that. I, there's no doubt that, that judgment is, it can be a, a, a real killer for your, for your kids. Mm -hmm. um, and, and teaching them that kind of skill set of data that comes in, into your face is strictly that. And it's really the judgment that you put on it that can twist it. This is, I hear this a lot from therapists, you know, the, the I heard you use the phrase limiting beliefs a number of times. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, what, what you can do is you can tell a kid and you can teach a, a kid the, the skill set of what happens to you is just a thing that happens to you. How you feel about it and what you do about it next is what's really important. You know, again, parenting in days gone by, and and you know, I will say this, and I said this actually on on, on my show earlier this week, is that you know, parents will say things like, "Hey, you know, you have a good life, feel better," right? Yeah. And that's that's simply not the way uh, you can effectively get a person to uh, to to kind of accept something that happens to them. What you do positive or negative is, you, you know, you say you have the, you have the control to make a judgment on that, but more importantly, allow them to feel it. Right. Yes. And, and that's where, you know, we, we use that phrase constantly uh, of empathy and mm -hmm. it's true. It really, I feel like we don't understand it. And there, I, I've used that phrase. I don't like to use on my show very much as I feel, but the, from what I see uh, qualitatively is, is the idea that we don't understand what empathy means, what it truly means to stand in someone else's shoes. 
and and look at the world from their perspective and how they might process that world mm -hmm. because it does it, i and i get a number of keynotes on this concept of reaction versus response mm -hmm. and we live in a reaction world if you're on social media right now and someone says something you don't like you react to to it, right? And often you don't react to it positively, particularly if it, if you're in the Twitterverse. The the truth is is that you know the the skill set that you can you can give someone about not putting instant judgment on something is to tell them to take a step back and to react. And the best way to react is the idea of asking a question rather than making a statement. Mm -hmm. So instead, so teaching my kids to be curious about someone. And again, let, let's use a, a straw dog adult example, which is, you know, everyone has in their feed someone that they disagree with politically. And you say something about, again, let's use Donald Trump because that was our, our straw dog for so long. Yeah. And the other person will, will react. Mm -hmm. But if you see someone say something about Donald Trump, like I really believe in his policies, instead of attacking them immediately, and I saw this a lot and got myself in a lot of trouble on social media mm -hmm. uh, around, uh, around Doug Ford, was just be curious about who they are. And be curious about where, the, where they are. If you, wanna, if you feel like you want to change their mind, you're never going to do it by to your point, throwing negativity in their direction, mm -hmm. the best positivity you can give is to say, you know what, I want to truly understand where you stand. And, and instead of taking the time to just constantly attack them, nobody wins an argument by attacking, is being curious and being empathetic is, is hugely valuable. And that is a positive experience. And, and I have, you know, of all of my kids, I have, there, there's one of them in the group who, who he will start every argument. He's going to make a great lawyer someday. And, and what I've said to him is if you want to win, if you want to win an argument, the first place that you start isn't with what, my, what great thing I'm going to say next, what positive or negative is truly understand who your opponent or the other person is and what they want out of the deal. And it, I think in a way that goes one step beyond the concept of simple affirmations. Mm -hmm. It's, it really is trying to strip the data around you of positive or negative and if you could do that, then you can put the spin on it that you want to. Yeah, you know, and I think it really, it's important, you know, you said to really understand, you know, and check in with that person and, you know, learn about that because that is where you create that, uh, that rapport, you know, and you may right. not have to agree necessarily with anyone, but you can absolutely build that rapport by listening because people feel her heard, they feel validated, and now you've drawn them in, right? So otherwise, you know, again, they are not going to take in what you're saying because you've come in sort of essentially attacking them, right, by your pers right. perception. So I do believe, uh, you know, very important again to to recognize that, you know, communication style, right? To be open to listening and to learning from others. And we're going to take a break here on the Mindset Mentor, and we will be back with more ways to learn how to help support team teens uh, with the mental health concerns right now as they navigate uh, this global pandemic. Stay with us, and we will be back with Jason Thomas. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Mindset Mentor on Saga 960 AM. Hope you're having an absolutely phenomenal day today. And, and listen, I want you to remember that your mindset is related to absolutely everything. So it is so important that we really do what we can to work our mindset. You know, I know that it's impossible to be positive every day, but, but just like going to the gym and you work out your abs, your triceps, your biceps, your quads, you know, you're going to strengthen and you're going to build that muscle. And that's what we're doing, you know, uh, with our mindset. And today we're focused focusing the conversation on helping to support teens with mental health concerns right now uh, during COVID. So many teens are struggling and battling and, you know, becoming depressed, having that, um, you know, the lack of contact with friends, whether again, it's like the lack of school. Some people are actually able to go to school depending on where you are, um, but the classes are online and it's not the same. Having, having a, a, a communication via Zoom or any, any, you know, phone, what have you, it's not the same as physical contact and we can make the, the best of it. And we're going to learn a little bit more with our guest, uh, Jason Tom Thompson. I, 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 Jason, Jason, listen, it's great to have you. I, I called you Jason Thomas the other moment, uh, just before we take, so I, I'm going to acknowledge myself. Hello. It is Jason Thompson. I know it's a complex and, and very <laughs> rare last name. 
<laughs> yeah, I know exactly. I have no excuse whatsoever. <laughs> but I know you're a good guy, a nice guy, so you're going to forgive me. So I I've fooled you already. Look at that. That's amazing. <laughs> well, listen, it's so great to have you here. Um, you know, right now there's there's so many changes happening, and and you know we t we talked about. Uh, you know, your own personal experience with you, with your, with your kids um, at home as well. And I was talking about my niece and I had said, you know, my experience, and I said, I, like, I want to acknowledge my niece and, you know, and some of the things that she's going through right now and her mm -hmm. friends and, and all of that. And I said, yeah, I said, you know, I get it. I said, you know, does it, does it suck right now? You know, being in the middle of a p pandemic? Yeah. Sometimes it does really suck. And, uh, you know, I, I understand that that's really difficult for you. Right. And I said, and your experience as a teenager is very different than my experience, you know, that I had as a teenager or that your mother had, you know, when she was a teenager or that your father had. So, you know, I think it's important just to acknowledge that, yeah, this is different. Right. And there, but there's always, always, always something positive in all of the challenges and adversity in life. So we talked about some of those, but I want to, you know, see and get your perspective on that. And, you know, do you think it's important to look further down the road and say, well, here's the potential good that can come from this situation in this moment? What are your thoughts on that? I, I, you can get there. But the thing is, is you can't start there. You know, there, I, I did some, some research on sort of the, the, the issues that the kids are, are starting with. And that's a great place to start it is come into it with some knowledge because, really with anything. And, and again, this comes into my professional side is you can't tell an, a, a kid or tell an audience how to feel. Mm -hmm. What you can do is you can get them to lead themselves to a, a positive place by being relevant to them. And, and one of the places with, with teens is by understanding kind of what's happening, you know, in between the ears. And there are really three, three really interesting places that are growing in terms of the mental health issues with kids like anxiety is a traditional one and we see a, a huge rise in anxiety and we we've talked actually about that on a number of our, our shows by the way our show is parents canada talk radio it's wednesdays 11 to 12 on saga 960 yeah, so three things that, that i did a <laughs> little promo there so three things are uncertainty uh social isolation and and parental angst and so the first one of un is uncertainty now that was that was acute early in in the game and it's getting higher now with all of the variants that are coming out and there's it, I'll be honest. And we, and again, I've talked about this on the show and with friends significantly is I felt that the communication infrastructure that we've received is cluttered mm -hmm. and confusing. And part of that is par for the course for where we are today. We live in a media sphere with strong social media where one person will say something and then somebody else will say the absolute opposite. And we don't have we don't have a clear understanding of, of what we're dealing with in terms of transmission and what drives the numbers and things like that. And that causes anxiety in parents and definitely causes anxiety in kids because they don't know what's happening. And that's a big part of growing up is making them feel safe by helping them deal with that uncertainty. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the second thing is this idea of social isolation. And that's the biggest one right now. We're in lockdown in Ontario. Uh, except for three very small areas, right? And and that number will will change. But and we just punted March break to become April break. Social isolation is becoming a thing in my own home. This is something I, I've I've dealt with tears and with with kids who just can't quite wrap their heads around it because. You know, when you, you talk about that, it's not not the same being on Zoom. It's the it's the concept of physical touch, mm -hmm. right? I have daughters; they hug. And if you don't have that opportunity, you actually lose that endorphin push. And because of that, it has an impact, right? And so social isolation becomes the secondary thing. And then the third one is, is then they see you freaking out. And this is the whole idea of parental angst, right? We find more today than we did say 20 years ago when we had the stoic parent who you know would hide everything from the kids. Mm -hmm. I'm the kind of dad who very much includes the kids in, in my, own, my own mindset. Now, I'm not asking them to take on the burden, but I'm allowing them to see that I'm a human being. And when I'm afraid, they know I'm afraid and it's okay and, and we are able to discuss it. But the thing is, is if you can address each of those three ideas of, of the uncertainty and the social isolation and the parental angst, when, when you get that out, when you allow them to unpack it, then you've opened the door for them to go, okay, I see the problem. Now I can do the positive side. I can look down the road and see silver linings and opportunities and things like that. And you know, one of the simplest ways you can get them there is, is ritual. So one of the things that 
uh, parenting experts, and, and I feel I'm more of a student than an expert because I'm an actual parent and I don't know what I'm doing most days, <laughs> is, the, is they tell the idea that uh, routine has been disrupted, particularly for younger kids. But the concept of routine is a, it, it's an anchor on which we build our lives. And as soon as you lose routine, you lose identity and the ability to um, really kind of traverse through the day with any sort of purpose. And so what you do is you can help your kids, like even when they're at, at home from school or whatever it is, is develop a sense of routine. And this is the important part is give them little things to look forward to right? Big things to look forward to weekend, Christmas, stuff like that. But little things, for example, in my house, we have something called Friday night dinner. It's the one night a week that we order out. And it's, we have a long discussion and debate and things like that on what we're going to have for Friday night dinner. But what it is, it's a little, it's a little benchmark. And in life, this is something for my own personal playbook is I instill little benchmarks everywhere. It, making coffee in the morning is a little benchmark, mm -hmm. right? Uh, exercise is a little benchmark. Uh, getting the chance to watch the Leafs game is a little benchmark. I have those for myself and what they, they really have dri driven some sense of sanity throughout the pandemic and they create joy in everyday life. If you can help your kids get there and build those little signposts for themselves, it's a really valuable thing. And on that idea of social isolation, my nine-year-old yesterday, uh, she, her best friend who they, they only see each other over Zoom right now, what they did was they did a, they did a porch exchange. So um, she showed up, my daughter had baked cookies and put cookies on the porch and she came up the porch and she dropped off a little gift and they were in masked and they were, you know, 15 feet apart, but they were able to have a quick conversation, little things like that. To, she looked forward to it all day and it affects the mood and it affects the opportunity. So again, back to your original question, 43 minutes ago, it, the idea is, is that you can't, you can't ask a person to be positive just on faith alone, yeah. allow them to express all the stuff, the fears, the, the issues and that sort of stuff. And then that allows them to lead themselves to those more positive outcomes and routine and those little signposts and milestones will help them get there. I love that. Yeah. You know, we need to absolutely listen and acknowledge, you know, the emotions and where they're at, um, you know, because it's going to be unrealistic to jump from being depressed to, you know, overly excited in your day. It's just not going to happen. Right. But right. those little signposts, as you say, gradually we can get there. And I think it's important that, you know, um, when you actually, you know, get uh to that, to that, you know, that little micro moment, that signpost, that next thing that you're working on, acknowledge it, have fun that you got there, right? Uh, because that's where we're going to release that dopamine in the brain, right? That feel good chemical. And that is what's going to help get you to the next signpost, the next, the next, the next, the next, right? Uh, to really create that joy. So we I, I'm, I'm glad away. you said that, uh, the yeah. acknowledgement part, because I yeah. do a lot of corporate recognition at very high levels with, uh, big organizations mm -hmm. and the the construct of recognition is a huge opportunity and it's not just a thank you thank you thank you it's thank you for dot 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 if you can express specifically what is bringing you joy and happiness it's really easy to replicate I love that. And the thank you for, it really personalizes, it, yeah. doesn't it? Right? You can go so, one step further with thank you for, you made me feel. And that's actually, when I teach people to write thank you notes in the financial industry, that's what I say. Thank you for describes what they did right. And you want them to keep repeating. And you made me feel says, this is the impact that it has. And if people feel that they have a strong impact on others around the, around the world, around the organization, around the family mm -hmm. is they will continue to replicate those behaviors and everybody feels better as a result. Oh, I love that. So what about, let's say, taking that philosophy into the home environment? So, you know, is it important to, to, to do that, um, you know, as a parent with the kids? You know, thank yeah. you for doing XXX, right? In um, fact, that's, I believe that's one of your number one parenting tools because oftentimes we, we coach to the, what I call coach to the report card. We focus on result. And the thing is, is that result doesn't just magically happen. It's, it comes because of perform the way, the way I always say it is um, great emotion drives great behavior, drives great performance, drives great result. And you can see result is the end of the line. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is you know, the worst time to ever recognize somebody is that after they did something like after the test, for example, with kids, 
the best time to recognize your kids is the second night of three nights that they're up studying late for the science test. Why? Because you're recognizing the behavior. And in life, nobody gives you a report card. What they do is they actually judge you based on the behavioral mindset that you bring to the game. So if you're a person, you know, years ago, I remember I was, I was on a panel with copywriters and they asked us for our best piece uh, of advice to new people who are new copywriters. And my, everybody else was like, get your portfolio out. And my piece of advice was don't be, well, I, used a different word, but I said, don't be a jerk because people hire people that they like. And that's the behaviors, behaviors that you develop as a teenager and growing up is that you become likable and approachable. And then people will hire you as, as a result of that. So start not at the, at the, with your kids is consistently recognize the behaviors and call out what they're doing, right? Cause you're reinforcing the things you want them to understand the things you want them to learn and the things you want them to repeat. And when they do that, as they grow up, they'll see that that is a pathway for success. Yeah. And, and it, you know, you're absolutely motivated to continue to try re- regardless of the result, right? Because some people have that yeah. that result as their main point and then you don't achieve it. And then all of a sudden you think you're a failure, right? It's not, you know, maybe you failed at that one attempt that you're trying to achieve, but you're never a failure, but we can get locked and hold on to that belief, which really immobilizes people. Um, so I think it's important, uh, certainly as a parent to, to have that, that wonderful communication uh, so that, you know, know that when your children grow up we don't all have those issues right because so many people um, are really trying to undo the layers uh, of accumulation from the past right but it's important check in with your kids no matter what age they are right check in and see how they're doing and what you can do to help them and have those really great deep conversations and if you're not able to do that then bring in someone you know who can and that could be uh, you know another parent uh, a family member or of course a therapist counselor, you know, help, right? Because being a parent, I think that's probably uh, the toughest job on the planet. I mean, you know, nobody knows how to do it right because you're always just, you know, it changes. There's not one book on parenting out there. But (laughs) listen, I, I... I don't know if you have time before the break, but I'm going through this right now. Like you look at a person who runs a parenting show and you think they've got to figure it out. Oh, yeah, the, right? It's yeah. the opposite. And in fact, I have a, I have a 19 year old son yeah. who went off to university in one of the most elite engineering programs in the country. Mm-hmm. Very, very bright kid when it comes to math, but I could see it already. I could see the behavioral mindset behind it wasn't there. Mm-hmm. And sure enough, in, last year he went off to school and, and he blew up halfway through semester he hit it really well. It wasn't until exam time that I figured it out. And so I brought him home. We coached him on behaviors and, you know, things uh, seem to be going great. And then he went back and started over again this year and, you know, got through, I saw his midterms. He was doing great. He was at 90 and all that sort of stuff. And then somewhere around December, you know, he did his exams and then he booked it for his mom's house. And I didn't hear from him for three weeks. And it wasn't until the end of the three weeks that I realized something's wrong. And sure enough, he blew up again. And so then the opportunity becomes is, you know, you you push and you shove and you jostle and that sort of stuff to drive him towards performance. And you realize that's not working for this kid you need. and, And what we've done is we've reset. So I've got a kid who probably is struggling with his mental health, but he's a math kid and he doesn't see, see that with any level of respect at this stage. Right. And so I have to draw him out slowly over time. And I need to do the opposite of what my, my inclination is, which is to say, push him to get back to university for September. And that's not what he needs. What he needs mm-hmm. is to figure out what, what I said was I gave you a playbook. Now you need to figure out your own playbook. And so what I'm doing right now is I'm biting my tongue very hard most days and saying, let him figure this out. Give him a little nudge here and there where it's required. Like, and again, I'm learning in through all of this process and I'm getting the chance to enjoy the kid. Like I, I'm getting the chance to learn from him. And, and I think for him, he's starting to see, like, I'm starting to see why he blew up. Mm-hmm. He's starting to see it too. And that's the important part. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That, that awareness. And that's, that's really interesting because um, I think that is hard for a lot of parents because they, they operate from what I want as a parent for you. And yep. you know, obviously parents always want the best and they believe that they know the best, but it, you know, that, that best that they have in their mind is absolutely not the best. You know, for the thing child. about the best though, is we look at the best in too small of an increment. The, mm-hmm. the job of a parent from my perspective is you're trying to get to your kids to a certain space, like 22, 23 years old, where they can make the decision on what comes next. And, yeah. and that's, that's really, for me, that's the only thing that, that I have to get there. And I have someone who isn't going to do well. Like I'd rather see him blow up at 19 than at 38. 
And that, that idea is, so now you have to take a longer view. So I can't be every failure. It's only a failure. If you look at it in a three month, six month increment, you know, if you looked at me when I was 19 years old, I'm not going anywhere. (laughs) But if you look at me in a 50 year run, because I'm going to turn 50 next month is that idea of now you get it. Now you see that in the long run is that there's a, there's a pattern for success for you. Yeah. And it is that there is a pattern for success and we just got to, you know, stay, stay strong and get through the challenges in life because we will always get through the challenges. Life is about those uh, temporary experiences, right? Everything is temporary, the good and the bad. So we just know that it's a cycle. We will get out of that, you know, tough cycle. And then we're going to get those challenges to evolve as a better person, right? They really, those challenges really develop us um, as a better person and, you know, be armed and, uh, you know, ready to help other people as well right through their challenges so we're going to take another break here no go ahead yeah jason there's something i was gonna say good isn't good without bad you can't have good without bad otherwise it's just the same yeah and we totally absolutely need variety in life right so we're going to take a break and we'll be right back here with more of the mindset mentor on saga 960 a.m and welcome back to the Mindset Mentor. I'm Tanya Kolar. Today, my special guest joining me is Jason Thompson. He is the host of Parents Canada Talk Radio right here on Saga 960 AM. And you can actually check out uh, Jason's uh, podcast, all the shows available online here at Saga960AM.ca. And also, uh, Jason, when does your show go live? We are on 11 to 12 on Wednesdays. I think they repeat it later in the day as well. And we now have, I think, close to 100 episodes in the bank. And there, we the big thing about the show that's really important is it's not necessarily as strictly, here are five things you can do for your kids, where you see, and you see that a lot in media. It's a show for parents. So this last week, because Valentine's Day, we talked about relationships and connection and sex and really what that meant for parents parents as opposed to you know having those conversations with your your kids it it really is about how you develop that and we spent a lot of time talking about covid and you Mm -hmm. talked earlier about boundaries and about space people are really really struggling with connection because they're on top of each other all the time and not in a good way yeah Wow. You know, that's really great. I think it's, it's important to have resources like that, that people can check in and learn uh, and try something different, right? And to get those solutions, you know, and having said that, you know, let's talk about, you know, some of the, the other solutions um, for right now to try to support your children who are struggling with mental health issues right now, uh, because there's a lot of challenges that we're all faced with and dealing with, whether directly or indirectly. So, you know, it's really nice to have some helpful tools. Um, you know, we did talk a little bit earlier about you know empathy and compassion and you know watching out for that judgment right right? because we're a little guilty of that Uh, especially i think at parents parents always think that they know they've got the right answers right (laughs) but that's the thing i was in the movie molly's game there's that moment late in the film where the dad is talking to his daughter and he says i'm going to give you three years of therapy in three minutes Mm -hmm. i'm going to tell you the answers and that's the secret right? That's the secret to anything in communication is you you can't tell anybody anything. You can sell them concepts, you can persuade them, and there are skill sets that you can use to get there. But but in that idea of empathy, that's how you allow them to lead themselves to, to that outcome. And in fact, I recently saw a great exercise. A bad thing that you can do to, to demonstrate empathy is to simply say, I understand. Because it, it, that's like a close-ended question. It just shuts the conversation down. If somebody says they're having a bad day and the, you know, they say something like, I'm, I'm having a bad day, I feel terrible. And you're like, I understand. That is empathy in that, that you're showing. It, it's actually more compassion, right? But right. what is, tell me more. And what you're doing then is you're drawing them out and you're allowing them to kind of purge that stuff. That we, have a, we had somebody on our show last summer that said something that we say every single show right now, which is hammer or hammock. And the concept is when you deal with somebody who is in distress or even is in a place of joy is you need to make a decision on, and you can literally say hammer or hammock to them. What does that mean? Hammer is, do you need me to do something? Do you need an outcome here? And hammock is, or do you just need me to listen? Right. And that's a classic thing that we hear an awful lot of time between couples, but it really does help with kids for, for, for empathy is, 
is that if you just want me to listen, do you want me to ask some questions to draw you out? Cause that's where good listening comes from is being able to ask those follow-up questions. And I, I love that hammer or hammock. It really, it changed a lot. And that's the secret I say is if you want to become a better parent, get your own parenting radio show. Cause you talk to experts every week yeah. and they teach you, they teach you stuff you didn't know. <laughs> I'm a way better parent than I was a year ago. Whoa. Absolutely. I love that. I love yeah. that. Well, I think you just helped a lot of parents out there as well with that hammer or hammock. And that's interesting. Yeah, because, it's so good. Yeah. Right. Um, and it's like, yeah, sometimes you just want to feel heard. You want, you know, someone to listen to you. That's it. Don't fix my yeah. problems. And another thing that you said, which I thought was interesting, right? So instead of just saying, yeah, I understand. Cause some people will say, yeah, I understand because I did this and da, da, da. So then you turn the conversation back on yourself. That right. is bad listening. When you're a good listener, you are absorbed in the conversation and fully engage with the other person listening, right? So when you're already thinking about what you're going to say, right, about yourself, that's that's not a great communication style. So I do think that that's really important. Listening, the, the key to listening, I believe, from what I've learned is this, and I heard this, oh, I, I can't believe I'm going to say this out loud. I heard this in a lecture from Jordan Peterson of all people. And when he said it, it actually, you know, you hear about active listening all the time. Yeah. This is it. Every single person that you're talking to knows 50 things. You know, 48 of those things. Your job is to find the other two mm. and you do nothing but worry about finding those other two. It's not a successful conversation as a listener. If you haven't pulled those other two out of them, if you can't get there, then you're doing exactly what you say. And, and by the way, that, that idea of, I understand and, or, or I know how you feel. That is the worst phrase in the English language. I know how you feel actually minimizes somebody's pain in a significant way. You should never, ever say that. Yeah. What you should say is that sounds difficult. Tell me more because because you don't want to, you don't want to minimize their experience. Everybody's experience is unique. And you, you, if you can recognize that and then start pulling that out with good questions, that's empathy. That's good active listening. I love that. All right. So, you know, we've got some really great tips and tools to really help us now, you know, be, be more compassionate, empathetic, have that beautiful listening ear. And then, you know, not to come in the conversa conversation with, you know, all this judgment, but to, and to actually, you know, really delve in and to know what the needs are right for that person. So is it that hammer or hammock moment? And, and, and then so that you can really navigate that situation much better together, right? And the other person also feels feels like they're not alone when they have that person who can listen without putting in all that judgment or the me, the me, the me, where the egos take over. Right. So I right. do think that that's, um, you know, really, really important to have. And, you know, we have just a few minutes left, Jason. So I'd love to ask you, are, are there any other, um, you know, final uh, bits of advice or insights that you would like, like to offer parents or even for teens directly, um, you know, who can, you know, learn and benefit from, from the advice that you'd like to share? I got one more and it's a big one. It's the concept of co-creation. What that means is as parents, we spend a lot of time thinking again, that idea of we know what's best for our kids and telling them stuff. Mm -hmm. But what we've learned is being a teenager, and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody who's been a teenager. It's a, it's a time of lack of empowerment. You are being dictated to as you're trying to find your path forward. And so the goal for you as a parent should be, yes, absolutely. Work, look out for catastrophic failures, things that are going to cause health issues, failure, whatever. But non-catastrophic failures is about co-creation. You're really, a, as a parent, you're really a coach in a way. Mm -hmm. And so what you want to do is include them in the conversation and listen to their ideas and try and work together to get to an outcome. And you know where the easiest way you do that is? Is dinner. What do you want? For, what should we have for dinner? Not what do you want for dinner? It's, hey, what should we make together? And in my house, we, we, we are really great at the end of the day as we all make dinner together. And it's fun. And, and the kids have a huge say in that. But if you extend that outwards, that idea of co-creation and say, if, if you, how would you solve this? Or what would you do? You know, um, I saw this just the other day. It's like, if, if you want to diffuse somebody who is uh, upset, it's, it's called motivational listening. And the concept around motivational listening is instead of saying, uh, I think that the example that they gave was somebody who didn't want to get the, the vaccine. And he said, instead of saying, well, you should get the vaccine, what you do instead is you, you, you put the onus on them to solve it. It's to say, well, how would you solve the pandemic? 
And suddenly the conversation becomes less adversarial and more inclusive and empowered. And if kids can feel that they can have a positive effect on the world around them, even if it's the world in their home, you will see more positive outcomes for mental health. Oh, excellent advice. And, you know, it's interesting because it sounds like such a simple, uh, you know, concept, but it can be very difficult, right? Because you're stuck in a habit of saying, hey, look, I'm going to do this or, you know, and so, you know, I love that co-creating, you know, with your, with your children, with everybody in the home. I mean, that could be great for a a relationship with your spouse as well, right? That co-creation, right? I love that. Well, and unfortunately we are out of time. So Jason Thompson, I want to say thank you so much for joining me today and helping uh, parents out there really better understand what's going on with their teens, you know, and checking in to make sure that they're all right and, and allowing uh, them to, to now be armed with some great tools that can help navigate that situation. So thank you so much. Fantastic. Awesome. All right, everyone. So that's a wrap for today's Mindset Mentor. And make sure that you continue to work out your mindset. And I will uh, tune in next Saturday at 11 a.m. And I look forward to chatting with you then. <laughs>